So we know how to find an antiderivative of a function. We're just looking for something whose derivative is that function. So for example, if someone said find the antiderivative of cos and x, well, we have to think of something whose derivative is cos and x. The derivative of sine x is cos and x. Um, of course, by corollary 2, once you've found 1, then the rest are all the same because they can't differ by anything more than a constant. So there's the antiderivative of cos and x. We might call that the general antiderivative because it includes a whole family of functions whose derivative is cos and x. Now, if we have to write out the words find the antiderivative, every time we want to find an antiderivative, it's going to drive us crazy. So we have some notation that will make it easier to express that concept. Now, the notation is a little bit complicated. It takes a minute to understand what's going on there. But let's imagine that we have a function, maybe y equals 2x. Now, if we take the derivative of that function, we could write the differential because the change in output is going to be the derivative, which is the slope, which in this case happens to be 2 times dx. So you can think of taking the derivative as sort of breaking the function down into its tiny changes, because if you want to get the change in the function, you just take the slope, which is the derivative, times the change in input. So let's write out some values for this function. We're going to have some x values, and then the y values will be given by 2x. I'll just do some basic y values here. Um, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, just some nice easy numbers. So what are the, what are the values? Negative 6, negative 4, um, negative 2, 0, 2, 4, 6. Let's look at the tiny changes in that function. Now, these aren't infinitesimal changes, so I'll use a delta y. Let's see. You can't get the first change because you need to have two numbers in order to find the change, but negative 4 minus minus 6 would be 2. Negative 2 um, minus minus 4 would be 2. 0 minus minus 2 is 2. 2 minus 0 is 2. 4 minus 2 is 2. Uh, 6 minus 4 is 2. Now, that's not very surprising, right? That's because the slope is 2, and we keep changing x, delta x in this case. Um, delta x in each case here is 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1, right? The slope is 2, so we have those changes of 2. But if you were to sum up uh, those changes in y, then you could recover the actual function. If you had some starting value, which I do, we have this value negative 6, then by adding in the changes, I can recover the values of the original, six, of the original function. So negative 6 plus 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 2 gives me the value 0. 0 plus 2 gives me 2. So just notice that by summing up those changes, what's happening is I'm reproducing, by adding those changes in, right, I'm reproducing the actual value of the function. OK, and this is the basis of our notation. So if you um, if you want to find the function y, you should sum up all the tiny changes in y, or be summing up all the tiny changes here. And this, and so if we sum up all the tiny changes, we'll get this function. Well, what function has these tiny changes? This pattern 2 dx, 2x plus c. Once I have a starting point, if I know some value, I can choose the constant in that particular case. So this is going to be our notation. The idea is that summing up tiny changes gives you back the original function. So the derivative finds the tiny changes, right? And summing up those tiny changes recovers the original function. So if I want to find the antiderivative of cos and x, I'll just write this. You could think of that as saying sum up all the tiny t sum up all these tiny changes. That's just saying, well, what function has that pattern in its tiny changes? Sin x plus any constant. We'll see how this notation is uh, uh, makes a lot of sense in some other cases as well, but for now that's the, that's the idea. You could say if you see this uh, stretched out s for sum, right, in front of these tiny changes, you're just you're just trying to figure out what function has this differential, right? or what function has that as its derivative with respect to x. That'll save us a lot of time. Let's do some examples here, just some basic antiderivatives. Remember, by corollary 2, if we can find any function that has that derivative, then all the others are just that function plus a constant. They can't vary by more than a constant. So if we can just find a function that has that derivative, we'll have it. Let's see. What kind of function has a derivative that's 0? Well, 
any constant function, right? So we could say, well, any constant, plus you could add any other constant, but that would still be an arbitrary constant. All right, what function has a derivative that's just a constant? Well, the derivative of kx with respect to x is k. So there's one function. My corollary 2, if you, you could add any, any constant in there, and you would still have an antiderivative, and um, all of the antiderivatives of that just vary right, by a constant. So this is all of them there. Let's see. What about what function has a derivative that's x to the n? Now let's think about what happens with powers. If you have a power and you take the derivative, the power decreases by 1. So if you're undoing the derivative, the power ought to increase by 1. So we ought to have x to the n plus 1, right? Uh, power should be 1 higher. But if we just check that by taking the derivative, we can see that there's an n plus 1 that's going to come down when we do that. So fortunately, that's just a constant, and constants come through derivatives. So I can just put a little extra 1 over n plus 1 in front. That way, when I take the derivative, this n plus 1 will come down and be canceled by the 1 over n plus 1. And we'll just have x to 1 power less. 1 less than n plus 1 is just x to the n. Throw in any constant there, and I have the entire family. Now I noted here that this wouldn't work when n equals negative 1, because you can see if n is negative 1, we'd have 1 over negative 1 plus 1. That would be 1 over 0. It would be undefined. So what do we do when n is negative 1? Well, if n is negative 1, we mean that we have 1 over x dx. We're asking what function has that pattern for its derivative. Um, and that would be the natural log of the absolute value of x. So, OK, and then we could throw in any constant there. Now, just a little warning. Um, sometimes in order to save space, the book thinks of this dx as being dx over 1. Then when you multiply these two fractions, you can write the dx, the tiny change in x up in the top. So they do that to save space because it saves about two characters worth of space. If you're trying to squeeze a bunch of stuff on one page, every little bit helps. OK, most of these you can see are just our derivative rules backwards. Um, notice that, in particular, um, if there's a constant in the function, you can just focus on finding the antiderivative of the function part. This is really just a, a consequence of the constant multiple rule. Right? If, the, if you take the derivative of a constant times a function, it's a constant times the derivative of the function. So you can just bring that constant out of the integral. That can help if you're working on a problem and there's something distracting. For example, if I'm trying to find the antiderivative of 7x squared dx, now I can just pull that 7 out. And now I can see I'm focusing on finding the antiderivative of x squared dx which uh, matches this case, right? So that should be x cubed and a 1 over, since n is 2, right? x to the n plus 1 would be 3. And a 1 over n plus 1 would be, um, uh, 1 over 2 plus 1 would be 1 third. So we have here now 7 thirds x cubed plus c. The point was I could bring that constant out so that it wasn't bothering me. And then I could just focus on the problem at hand. If you have a sum of two functions, of course, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. And so if you run that backwards, you find that the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. This is because the derivative of this thing, well, if you take the derivative of this sum, it's the sum of the derivatives. And of course, the derivative of the antiderivative of f of x would be f of x. And the derivative of this would be g of x. And you'd get what you wanted, f of x plus g of x. Same thing if it's a difference. It doesn't matter if it's a plus or a minus sign between them. The derivative of the difference is the difference of the derivative. So the integral of the difference is the difference of the integrals. Mm, what about e to e to some constant times x? Well, if it had just been e to the x, we would know that would just be e to the x plus c, because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. If we see e to the kx, I would guess that the answer would be something like e to the kx. But if I actually check it by taking the derivative, the derivative with respect to x of e to the kx would be e to the kx times the derivative of the function up here with respect to x. The derivative of kx with respect to x is k. So if I take the derivative of this, there's an extra k. What I'm going to do is put a 1 over k. That's going to be a little trap. If there's a 1 over k here, then it will come through the derivative. Right? Derivatives just constant just pass through derivatives. And now when this, when this k comes out that I didn't want, it will be canceled by the 1 over k. So I've set a little trap for that k that's coming up because of the chain rule.